Welcome back, Defenders. Jake here. This is Rich. U.S. approval of strikes on Russia enabled Ukraine to halt the Russian offensive in Kharkiv. According to U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, so the guy who did not want to change the policy about Western weapons being used on the territory of Russia admitted he was wrong. This did not lead to a nuclear escalation. Putin is not going to nuke anyone over this. And Ukraine can now defend their border. And I'm not really much of a map update guy because nothing significant is really happening. Currently, right now, we're in the middle of Russia's big summer offensive. And they're not really achieving much. When we go to the border near Belgorod and uh, Kharkiv, here's the Russian side, here's the Ukrainian side. We can get out the ruler. The Russians started here, and they've gone about five kilometers. The first stepping stone was to take the relatively small city of Vovchansk, and the Russians can't even do it. They probably spent six months preparing for this invasion, 30 or 40,000 Russian troops streaming across the border, and Putin says the objective is to create a buffer zone I'm guessing they would want at least 30 kilometers deep. And this has been an absolute disaster for the Russians. And with this policy reversal, it's just going to get worse every single day for the Russians along the border. Russian command node hit in Ukraine's first warplane strike inside of Russia. So yes, the Ukrainian Air Force is still flying combat missions, two and a half years into this war, and Russia can't defeat Ukraine's air force. And now they're dropping bombs from jets on Russian territory. So it's not just artillery, it's not just HIMARS. Jets are launching ordnance into Russian territory. Here is a command post in the village of Shebekino on the Russian side of the border. This was the command post for the 6th Combined Arms Army. I can show you where this is on the map. So this is Vovchansk on the Ukrainian side. The 6th Army was using this as their command base on the Russian side. And it got blown up by the Ukrainians with a missile launched from a plane. F-16s haven't even arrived yet. Ukraine to test homegrown guided bombs in a few weeks. Russia, especially the last six months, has been launching a lot of these guided bombs, 3,000 a month. These are dumb bombs with uh, a glide kit added to it, and you can't shoot them down because they don't offer a heat signature. They're very large bombs, uh, 500 kilograms or above, and Ukraine is working on their own answer to this. They want to produce their own glide bombs, that they can launch from either their Soviet MiGs or from incoming F-16s. Now, the United States and Western allies do provide JDAMs. This is basically the same thing. A glide kit added to a dumb bomb, but Ukraine needs to produce their own. They need larger quantities than what can be supplied to them from the West. And it's going to be interesting to see how many of these glide bombs can Ukraine produce on their own every single month. Okay, so the top story from the last two days, I'm going to do my best to explain what I understand. I am not an EU voter. I am brand new to trying to understand EU parliamentary elections. But there was an election in Europe, and this is significant for Ukraine. So 185 million EU voters across 27 countries voted in their parliamentary elections. These elections occur every five years, and there's 720 seats in the EU Parliament. You vote for parties. Parties have a list of candidates. Those candidates then fill the seats. So the largest vote-getting party in the EU Parliament was the European People's Parliament with 26%. Socialists and Democrats, 18%, so forth and so forth. So the top headline is that 
pro-Ukrainian EU parties did maintain their majority. They are going to form the coalition governments, and the majority of the parliament still supports Ukraine. But far-right parties with sympathies towards Russia did gain seats. You can see from this breakdown, we have the far left over here, the far right over here. There's non-aligned seats that were filled from various districts, but... How I understand it is that a lot of EU voters are upset about immigration and asylum policies. They're also upset with environmental laws and carbon taxes. The Green parties lost voters, they lost seats. And ultra-nationalist far-right parties gained seats. So this does have people in Europe concerned. But the center is holding, according to von der Leyen. So Ursula von der Leyen, she is the president of the European Commission. I'm assuming she's going to remain the president because uh, she'll probably continue to lead this coalition. But within Europe, there's a serious divide between the Nordic countries in Eastern Europe and then Western Europe. So if you're from uh, the Nordic countries or Eastern Europe, you did great None of your people voted for political parties that support Russia. The problem is Italy, France, Germany, and Belgium. And this map of Germany is very striking. 35 years after the reunification of the German people, when they have elections, you can still see the difference. This blue uh, mostly voted for the AFD. And the AFD has problems with Nazis. They say things that are sympathetic towards the Nazis, their Nazi history, uh, and they're also very pro-Russian. I'm greatly oversimplifying this. I'm sure there are some genuinely good people part of the AFD party, but they do have members in their party who say some pretty insane things sympathetic towards their Nazi history. So to me, this is very striking that the territory of Germany that was denazified by the Russians seems to be the most pro-Nazi today. You can see the black here. This is uh, uh, West Berlin inside of East Germany. So this is crazy. I don't think I should speak any more on this because I'm probably embarrassing myself, but let's talk about Orban in Hungary. Orban had a terrible night in the EU elections. Uh, for the first time, his populist ultra-nationalist party didn't receive the majority. So they had their worst voter uh, turnouts since 2004. He still got the most votes, 44%, but he's going to have to rely and partner with a smaller party in order to form a coalition. This is for the EU Parliament, not Hungary's governing body. It's all very complicated in America. We only have two parties, and it's pretty straightforward. So the, the earthquake that really uh, shocked the system is that Chancellor Schultz's party in Germany didn't get the most votes, and Macron's party in France also didn't get the most votes. So Macron decided to dissolve the French parliament and call for new elections inside of, inside of France, in response to the EU parliamentary vote. So in France, uh, the far-right populist candidate is Marie Le Pen. She's run for the presidency of France in 2012, 2017, and 2022. She's the leader of the National Rally Party. Macron is in charge of the Renaissance Party. So what Macron is doing is he's trying to hold new elections now in order to stop this changing trend of the far-right party in France gaining more popularity. Macron explained that he wanted to give the French people the choice of our parliamentary future through the vote. Macron's party, the Renaissance Party, came in second in the European elections, gaining less than half of the national rally votes. So Macron's party got 15%, while the far-right Marie Le Pen party got 31%, twice as much. 
So this seems tricky. What is Macron up to? And the reason why he's holding these elections now, unlike the single list proportional representation system used to elect members of the European Parliament, the French Parliament is elected via a two-round system of single-member constituencies. In the French system, a candidate must get over 50% to win, with the French president placing a bet that far-right candidates won't be able to get that. So you can do the math. Uh, 15 and 31 isn't even 50%. So Macron is trying to trigger a new round of parliamentary elections in France to beat the far right, because he doesn't think the far right can get over 50%. So if Macron can just finish in the top two, it's going to be Marie Le Pen and Macron. There has to be a second round of votes to get over 50%. And Macron is assuming that everyone to the left and in the center will just consolidate around him to stop Marie Le Pen and the far right from getting the presidency and a majority in, in their parliament. That's how I understand it as an outsider, as an American. I don't know if I got it right. All I know is that I want President Macron to stay in power. Marie Le Pen has uh, expressed pro-Russian sympathetic views in the past. And Ukraine really needs uh, France's support at this time. So let's get back to the war zone. Ukraine blows up one S-400 division and two S-300s in Crimea. This was a huge and successful operation. Here are the before pictures. We don't have the satellite after pictures yet, but when Russia sets up their air defense systems, they're pretty noticeable. And this was about 12 attackums striking three different parts of Crimea. In Jankoy, two radar stations were destroyed. And then the air defense systems are located over here. So they have time to uh, shield and protect the port city of Sevastopol. This is the first satellite image we've got of the destruction of the radar stations in Jankoy. We're going to get more satellite images soon, but... Yeah, this is a couple billion dollars worth of air defense systems that Russia just lost. Here's an interesting telegram post. Russian air defense soldiers have been ordered to evacuate their families from Crimea and relocate them to the southern military district in Rostov-on-Don. So perhaps the Russians know something we don't. How many times has Ukraine blown up an air defense system located in this area? And it's every couple months. So eventually, Russia's going to run out of air defense systems. For an update from an ordinary Russian soldier, I've got a clip from Anton. It's currently summertime. These guys look like they're enjoying a nice, cool breeze somewhere in the occupied territories. But this is what these Russian soldiers have to say about the coming winter. The person holding the camera is asking this Russian soldier questions. So are you ready to stay here for three years? That's my answer. And he uh, holds up his middle finger. So you don't like the news that we can stay here? Of course I don't like that. I don't want to be here in the winter. There's no provision, no food, no clothes. Look at this stuff. We wear what we find in the houses. You don't believe me? Look at this guy. The exact same thing. The Russian military doesn't issue proper uniforms to their soldiers. So Russian soldiers for the last two and a half years have been robbing Ukrainian homes in the occupied territories. They take socks, underwear, clothes, food, electronics, anything they can find. And yeah, that's a pretty goofy sweater on this Russian soldier. Comrade Zora signed a contract. How long do you have left to serve, Zora? Two more years. No, I mean urgent service. Nine months. Three months of service and signed a contract and went to Ukraine, FSB comrade. Woof, meow. There's another demon sitting there. See his head. He zooms in on this guy in a trench. That's a effing elephant, and that's Casper. 
he has armed forces of Ukraine on his boots. He's then going to show this Russian soldier's boots right there. See the AFU logo on the side of this Russian soldier's boot. And that's our blogger. Tell us what to do. Like, click the bell, follow us for more news. They rob Ukrainian soldiers of their boots, so the Russians have something decent to wear. Ukraine destroyed a book air defense system in Donetsk with FPV drones. Uh, this is the book air defense system. I'll link the video down below if you want to see it for yourself. Concerning that Su-57 fifth generation stealth bomber, uh, looks like Ukraine might have damaged two of the planes. So this is the best resolution satellite image we've received. You can see on the apron a drone hit here and here, damaging this plane. But reports are on Russian telegram channels that perhaps this one or this one also received a piece of shrapnel, and it's been partly damaged. Su-34 fighter bomber worth 36 million crashes in Russia. This occurred in uh, North Ossetia. The crew died, and Ukraine had nothing to do with this. This was a scheduled training flight, and it crashed due to a technical malfunction. So, The Russian ship Admiral Levchenko is on fire in the Barents Sea. The Barents Sea is up here in the Arctic Ocean, and once again, Ukraine had nothing to do with this, but Russian ships seem to be incredibly flammable. It's either sabotage or incompetence, but Russia's Navy has problems. Ukraine confirms attack on Novoshitinsk oil refinery, claims damages totaling $540 million. This was a Ukrainian drone strike on an oil refinery on June 5th. And it's estimated that Russia lost, in the fire, half a billion dollars worth of oil. Their profit on this oil wasn't going to be half a billion, but if half a billion dollars worth of oil just vanishes, this is a huge loss for Russia's oil industry. This is why Gazprom and other Russian oil companies are no longer profitable. Massive fire at a Russian ammo depot in Belgorod Oblast after a Ukrainian attack. All of Russia's command posts, ammunition depots, fuel warehouses. Within 90 kilometers of the border, they're all going to go pretty soon. U.S. confirms Ukraine used a Patriot to down Russia's valuable A-50 early warning radar plane back in January. This is a United States Army colonel uh, speaking at some kind of symposium. And I don't think she was supposed to admit this, but she did it on camera. And uh, let me play for you this clip. You know, you, you know what you gave them, whether it's a battalion of Iris T, a battalion of Patriot, um, and the capabilities that those provide. Take a look at how they're using them. Uh, they have probably about a Patriot of battalion operating in Ukraine right now. Some of it's being used to protect static sites and critical national infrastructure. Others are being moved around and doing some really, uh, really historic things that I've, I've, I haven't seen in 22 years of, uh, of being an air defender. And one of them is, is a Sambush. <laughs> What's become to come to be known as the service air ambush, service air missile ambush. Um, and they're doing that with extremely mobile Patriot systems that were donated by the Germans because the systems are all mounted on the trucks. So they're moving around and they're, they're using these types of systems, bringing them close to the flat to gain and, and stretching the very, very edges of the kinematic capabilities of that system to engage the first A50 <laughs> C2 system uh, back in January. We have a new term, SAMBUSH, surface-to-air missile ambush. And back in January, the Russians were flying their AWAC plane over the Sea of Azov near Berdansk, and the United States admitted it. Uh, the Ukrainians took a Patriot launcher, probably pretty close to the front line, and they successfully shot down this $350 million plane 
and the entire crew on board was lost. A month later, they were flying the plane over Rostov-on-Don, Russian territory. And we don't know exactly how Ukraine shot down that plane as well. The Russians think it's better to declare incompetence, and they shot down their own plane. But I think Ukraine probably used some kind of converted missile in order to shoot down that second A-50 in February. But here's the truck. Uh, Ukraine probably shouldn't have released this, but this is the Patriot truck showing all of their kills. Uh, every time they shoot something down, they paint it on the side of the truck. And there it is. That's the A-50 AWAC plane painted on the side of the Patriot launcher confirming Ukraine shot it down. Wow. Air Force official, Ukraine to protect its F-16 fighter fleet by basing planes in other countries. This is driving the Russians insane. But I think what's happening here is uh, the F-16s arriving in Ukraine, when they're flying combat missions, they're probably going to take off and land somewhere in Ukraine. But if a jet isn't going to be used for a couple days or a week or two because of maintenance or training or something, Ukraine is going to relocate those F-16s somewhere else. Poland, Germany, Denmark, I don't know. I don't think anyone's going to... I'm not going to talk about it. But Ukraine is going to shuffle active warplanes between the war zone and then safe territory somewhere in NATO. This is the only way to protect the planes long term, and I support this. Let's get to the good news for Ukraine. France's fails to supply Ukraine with a second CM200 air defense system. Thank you so much to the people of France. Finland exports state-of-the-art weapons to Ukraine, including prototypes in development. So unlike many other Western supporters of Ukraine, Finland does not reveal specific details of its military aid to Ukraine. They don't want to tell the Russians. So thank you so much to the incredible people of Finland. I know you guys are helping. Schultz says Germany will transfer a third Patriot system, additional Iris T's and Gepards to Ukraine. Thank you so much to the German people. And uh, I think one of these Patriot trucks is going to go hunting with Sam Bushes. Sam, Sam Bushes. That's a weird word. Final clip I have for you is from a book fair in Ukraine. Portrait of a book fair in wartime. And this is the Book Arsenal Festival. And this clip is from Yaroslava. These books on display are from the printing house in Kharkiv that Russia tried to destroy. Because this printing house prints books in the Ukrainian language, Russia wasted a million dollar missile to destroy this publishing house, killing seven civilian workers, just printing books. Here are the books uh, that Russia tried to destroy on display. A hundred years from now, when Ukrainian children go on school field trips to learn about their history, about how their soldiers fought for their independence and freedom from Russia for good, these school children are going to see this display. They're going to learn about the books in the Ukrainian language that the Russians deliberately tried to destroy, to deprive them of their language, their culture, their history, their identity. And it didn't work. Russia is going to lose this war. That's all for this update video. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. If you found this video informative, give me a thumbs up. Best way to support the channel. 
comments and questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, keep defending the truth, keep defending democracy.